Obviously, so much talk about what is going to happen with this economy. Are we or are we not going into a recession? Given your Venture for America background, I'm curious what your outlook is if you are an entrepreneur uh, trying to get started in a downturn. Well, if you look at the track record of high growth companies, uh, Emily, and you know this full well, most of the really meaningful companies get started in a downturn like this one for a host of reasons. Uh, the fact is that an enterprise that succeeds in this time is going to be poised to really uh, mushroom as soon as the climate starts turning more positive. So I do think that this is going to be a very, very tough time, but guaranteed we're going to see tons of meaningful firms come out of uh, this period. What's your sense of how this tough time will compare to, let's say, the financial crisis or even the dot-com bust? Is there something different about it? No, uh, I think we have a, a, a ways to go uh, on the down slope myself. I mean, we can all see very clearly that the Fed is going to be jacking up interest rates for the foreseeable. And uh, there are a lot of uh, valuations that don't make as much sense uh, in that environment. So we're, we're going to all find out together how this compares to some of the tough times of the past. But uh, I certainly think that uh, folks should try and keep some uh, powder dry, uh, you know, make sure that you have enough cash to make it through for a little bit longer than you might hope. San Francisco is, is one city that's having a, a tough time recovering from the pandemic, and now there's this downturn. You've got companies going remote. You've got companies moving to Austin or Miami. Do you think this the center of innovation, the, the fundamental center of gravity, is actually going to shift and become more distributed, or is it too early to say that? No, you and I both have friends uh, who have decamped to Austin or, or Miami. Uh, and I'm a big believer that innovation and growth will follow wherever the talent goes. So uh, if you have people who have permanently settled uh, in Austin, I think you're going to see uh, a permanent shift, truly. Um, now, the Bay Area, in my view, still has the highest concentration uh, of tech talent. So it's still going to be the envy of many other cities. Uh, but I, I do think we're in a permanently different time where talent is going to be more distributed. And because of that, you're going to see capital be more distributed uh, and growth companies come out of places where they might not have otherwise. Congress has been trying to rein in big tech and big tech has retaliated by spending a ton of money to kill one of the most aggressive oversight bills in years. What's your thought on on whether that bill potentially needs to be revived and whether strong regulation is really needed. Oh, it, it's interesting, Emily. The po political climate has changed such that tech uh, now uh, is a bit of a punching bag for both parties. Um, and I'm of the, the belief that there have been some excesses that uh, regulation would be a, appropriate for. And a lot is going to hinge upon what the political climate is after these midterms. Uh, right now, the Senate is a toss up by mo most accounts. Republicans are slightly favored uh, in the House. And I, I think that might change the prospects of some of the, the bills that we're talking about. You've been very vocal about data collection. You launched the data dividend products to help Americans take control of your data. How are you feeling about how tech com companies are handling that data right now and especially going in to an election? Uh, you know, it's it's fascinating, Emily. As you know, I, I championed uh, the CPRA and data privacy uh, regulations in California, where you are. And because California has now set a higher bar, uh, national legislation is increasingly likely and on the table, in part because tech companies wanted to supplant and replace the, the rules in California. Uh, our data is being used not to our benefit. It's a $200 billion plus a year industry. It's eroding our democracy, our kids' mental health. Um, so uh, I'm someone who thinks that we should own our data uh, and not only have it used more to our benefit, but if there is going to be market value gained, we should join in that benefit. Um, so that, that's where I'd like the national approach to go. Europe has new rules that are coming online in 2024, which is right around the corner. And I think that's going to increase pressure on the states to have 
uh, a more modernized approach. You've been branching out into crypto and Web3, and I'm curious what role or how much of a role you think crypto will play in fundraising going into 2024, and if you think Democrats or Republicans have more of an advantage. No, I, I think the single biggest donor in the last cycle was Sam Bankman Fried, who you all probably know well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Web3, uh, in, in my view, is going to be a very fascinating um, uh, political force uh, to be reckoned with. Um, right now, they're concerned, uh, obviously, um, largely with the regulation uh, of crypto itself. Um, but I, I think that you're going to see more people pushing into politics because now uh, the interaction with DC is going to be one of the main drivers uh, of whether enterprises are able to, to grow and operate um, successfully uh, anywhere, but certainly whether they're going to be headquartered here in the US. You also launched uh, Lobby 3 earlier this year. I'm so curious, how many people have bought into the tokens and what positions is Lobby 3 going to be advocating for? Yeah, Lo Lobby 3 has been a, a great energized community of people that want to uh, push for common sense regulation out of DC um, that is intelligent and sophisticated and doesn't try and throw different um, types of assets together that has one regulator instead of kind of a, a hodgepodge. Um, uh, and it's been awesome getting to know people uh, who want the best things for creators and entrepreneurs in, in the space. Um, Any time I go to a, a Web3 gathering, there's some folks uh, who are part of the Lobby3 community, and it's been a lot of fun. As a former presidential candidate and the co-chair now of the Forward Party, I'd love to see into your crystal ball. Do you think a Biden-Trump face-off in 2024, is that inevitable? It's the most likely matchup right now, Emily. Uh, the odds are that Trump declares at the end of this year after the midterms, and then Biden declares either Q1 or Q2 of next year. Um, I will say that those two candidates will have a combined age of 159 in 2024, and 58% of Americans are not excited about either of them. So the, the question is whether a unity ticket or some independent effort arises, and a group called No Labels has very publicly invested $53 million in uh, ballot access for a potential unity ticket. I think there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm for some alternative after people face the reality that it is a rematch in 2024 between Trump and Biden. So let's say Biden doesn't run. Do you think the Democrats have a strong enough bench? Who's on that bench? Would you consider uh, running again? Well, I think Joe Biden likely declares because he feels he's the only one who can defeat Donald Trump because he did it once. And you can't argue with the fact that he did defeat Trump once. Um, but it's also tough to slot in uh, another Democrat who you have the same confidence in uh, necessarily if you're Joe or even if you're anyone, because right now um, it's unclear who the Democratic nominee would be. Um, I think that's one reason why Joe's going to run again, honestly. So how are you going to spend the next couple of years if you're not uh, running again? You know, where are we going to see you uh, place your energy and efforts and priorities given a you know very critical election coming up? Uh, so the Forward Party has endorsed a number of candidates around the country, including a U.S. Senate candidate named Evan McMullen, whom I'm going out to campaign in Utah for. Uh, th this weekend, we think we need to change the underlying incentives uh, for uh, our lawmakers and leaders by doing away with uh, closed party primaries and replacing them with primaries where anyone can vote for anyone through something called ranked choice voting. If there's one thing you remember from this interview out there, if, if you're you know generally not that into politics, ranked choice voting is the way out of this mess. It's a way that anyone can vote for uh, anyone with no spoiler effect, and it rewards more moderate, reasonable, collaborative candidates who actually come through for 51% of voters. Um, so I'm going to be trying to make ranked choice voting the law in as many places as possible. And I'm happy to say it's spreading around the country.